Alright. When I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. Nothing about the past, nothing about the future. Alright. Welcome back to Draft Fuzz. My name is Walter, and on today's episode, we got a lovely guest. Yes, we're talking about the Browns again, but you know what? I say what goes on this show, and on today's show, we got a great guest, maybe a better Browns fan than me. Uh, I'm bringing on Rod Bloom. Uh, you can find him at uh, at CLE Rob B. He is the host of the Browns Blitz podcast. It's one of the best uh, Browns podcasts around, probably at least top two or top five or top top number. Uh, Browns podcast, but he's a great guy to listen to. Go check out his show. I will put it in the, I'll put his uh, show link in the profile. Y'all can find it. You can follow him, subscribe, subscribe to the podcast, do all that stuff because as a thank you for him coming on. And thanks for coming on, man. Absolutely. Glad, glad to do it. Glad to, glad to be talking to you again. Right, I had a lot of fun on your show, so I was like, you know what? Let's bring yeah. him on. Uh, you know, I'll go ahead and we'll get to talk. You know, I wanted to have you on after the the draft because you were actually you you had some very good commentary on it. Not, not to expect too much on like this draft class. That yes, it's going to be a big turnaround. And yes, it's exciting, but it's also like you have to have some level of measure with it. But yeah, uh, what what were your thoughts? What was your thoughts draft day when you're sitting there watching the you know day one coming in and then day two we're getting some players. What did you think of the class overall? Overall, I mean the, the whole class. I, I think it's a, I think it's a great class. I mean, you know, I, I expected Andrew Barry to do a great job because it's Andrew Barry, you know, and uh, <clears throat> you know this is only his second draft for us, but uh, but you know he's he's already got the reputation of, of he's going to do an excellent job, so. Uh, the more you look into these guys that he drafted, it's like the more you feel like he hit a home run probably on, you know, more often than not with each of these guys, or they all have the potential to be, to be outstanding picks. Uh, the the thing that kind of surprised me with this is I was thinking of with this roster and the depth that, that there already was on this roster with, with the guys he had from last year and the free agents that they signed. I was surprised that, that they made, um, that he made eight picks. And the fact that there's uh, that there's eight guys that were picked, and when I look at them, it looks to me like these eight guys they're probably all going to make the team. Quite potentially, yeah. Well, yeah, they, so uh, like especially when you look at the Tony Fields pick, right? Which is a fifth round guy, uh, linebacker out of West Virginia. Um, it almost feels like he's the direct backup to J uh, Jeremiah Wusu Koromo, who they drafted in the second round, because it's like they're built the same. Uh, I. I kind of almost been described as a, a discount version of Jeremiah Wusukoromo. You get Tony Fields. It sounds like they have an identity, a plan, which is not like we just drafted this guy and then this backup is going to be a different linebacker. They have like, oh, we want this guy particularly for this reason, for this role. So, yeah, it does look like a lot of these guys are probably going to make the roster, which also means guys on the roster currently probably are not sticking around too long. Uh, that That's very possible. And my understanding is that uh, – that Fields has put some weight on that he's up around 230. Uh, I've actually heard that on my podcast last night. So uh, <laughs> that's a good thing to hear. Um, yeah, that's a good thing. And, and uh, you know, so I don't know what his role is going to be. You know, if he's not, if he's not, you know, I wouldn't expect him to be a starter right out of the gate, but, um, you know, he's certainly going to be a, a great guy in special teams. And he's, he's, he certainly looks like he's got all, all the tools to be a starter down the road. So it just, it looks like an excellent pick. Yeah, I mean, again, like they, they've kind of. It was funny because everybody went into this year being like, linebackers a big issue, linebackers a big issue. Oh, they don't value linebacker. Well, if you're gonna take picks on linebacker, one, you want to make sure that there's like some familiarity, some similarity to them. So that's why I was saying like Jeremiah yeah. Sukormo, similar size to what he's going I think Jeremiah is gonna be able to do way more than what Fields can do. But again. Like you're saying, now Fields is up to 230. You know, he's he's still like a packed bullet. And they still have, yeah. like right now when you look at the weak side linebacker position, because I think that's where the competition's going to be going into the year. You know, if you look at Malcolm Smith is there. Um, Mac Wilson, who is a Dorsey guy. You know, he was drafted, a, you know, like fifth round guy. And he's been on the roster. And, you know, I think it's going to be a fight between those three guys as to who gets to stay. Some of it might be special teams. Some of it might be you know, how they do with this current scheme. Now, the difference is this this office drafted Tony Fields, and now you're also getting him on a four-year deal, whereas Mac Wilson's kind of right. towards the end of his deal. So maybe they keep Wilson around. Maybe I, I think Smith might be the guy who 
maybe they cut him week one, bring him back, because he doesn't have a lot of money on his deal. So I think Smith was like a coverage thing of like, if we don't get somebody in the draft, we have somebody here. But the linebacker. Yeah, that, that's really very possible. Different. Yeah. Yeah, he signed for a lot. I think it was right around a million or, or just under a million. So, so yeah, yeah it's kind it's of a, like 500,000. That's like, uh, uh, is guaranteed. yeah, guaranteed. So he could be yeah, on the roster. That's he very possible. Um, yeah, I mean, and that's another thing. I think going into this draft, we really didn't know, you know, how they valued or didn't value the linebacker position. Um, I think they value it a little bit. So, you know, but with these two picks, uh, they they kind of see that it's important. They, you know, they, they didn't try to trade up for Micah Parsons or anything, but they knew the guys they wanted, and I think they got the two guys that probably wanted out of this draft at linebacker. Yeah, well, I think they got the guys they wanted just in general because even like you saw Greg Newsom as he got to them at 20, uh, 25, 26. Uh, I can't believe now I'm forgetting the picks that they had. At this point, it's, it's yeah. been a week. I've forgotten all the numbers. The numbers are gone. Oh, I know. It's, uh, it's now it's <laughs> on to the next thing. But uh, when they drafted uh, Greg Newsom and I'm sitting there going, I, I was shocked Newsom fell, but I heard that rumor that he wasn't going to go as high just a couple days before and I'm like he's not going as high and I actually did a mock draft and I had him going to the Browns I think part of it Nathan Zagura was calling this like from a mile out he was high on the on the Greg Newsom train he's like if he's there we're yeah. taking him I was just shocked he was there I was shocked that like the Titans the Cardinals Cardinals went linebacker they said we want uh Zayvon Collins so they they figured out what they wanted and the Browns were like thank you for taking him we got our guys and I think I think JOK was uh Jeremiah Cormo was like a top guy on their board it was I think it, it, that second round they had they had guys pegged that they were hoping were like borderline first rounders mm -hmm. and JOK was definitely one of them I think Aziz Ojolari might have been one of the other ones and when he went off the board they went emergency get up there find a way to do it and not be doing it expensively yeah, yeah, they they um they knew what they were doing with JOK, and uh, yeah, they um they definitely wanted him, and I think they knew how much he was going to to fall because of the perceived heart issue. So um so they played they played their hand perfectly. That's what yeah. they did. And they, they pretty much got two first rounders, which which they're good at. I mean. <laughs> What was last yeah. year? I mean, Delpit was a very highly rated player coming out. And, yes, he had the question yeah. of the tackling and, you know, a little bit of injury concern coming out. I think he had the high ankle sprain that he was playing on the whole year. But yeah. still, like, he was a guy who was highly rated, who the year before people were talking about him as potentially being a top 10 pick in the draft. So, right. you know, they, they seem to find the guys that are like, listen, that's our value point. And, it, you know, safety and linebacker devalue positions. So if you're going to get a high value one, second round's probably the perfect place to get him. I, was it uh, Darius Leonard went in the second round a couple of years ago? Mm -hmm. um, and he was he became an all pro right out of the basket. So maybe that's what we're hoping for. We get the all pro out of the basket, and we have to worry about it. Yeah, I mean the Browns, uh, and they did they did a lot, or they didn't do several things that I thought they were going to do. You know, they 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 end up. Uh, you know, I, I thought that going into day two with with having two thirds and two fourths. You know, along with uh, you know picking. At 59, I thought that they would, um, and of course they traded up to 52, but I thought they would trade up higher than 52, you know, up near the, closer to the top, maybe, you know, like 40, 45, you know, to get, to get a guy higher in the second round and maybe even trade in the second round twice. Again, thinking they only want like four or five guys out of this draft. Why wouldn't they get, you know, a first rounder, a couple of seconds, and then maybe a fourth and a fifth. I mean, I, I definitely... That's what I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would have been kind of fun. I I think they still value those picks. Like, I, I think the um the Barry and Podesta mindset's still there. As long as you're getting guys into camp, because, like, those guys from the fifth round on, they're all kind of like, you know, maybe LeCount ends up playing for them, but also he's one of the few guys I think probably could sneak onto the practice squad if they kind of released him. Or they waved him and they got him on the practice squad. Uh, but you're getting guys it, in the camp possibility. to see them. Um, and again, I think they had guys at positions pegged. I think if you look at the guys that they were tied to, there were a lot of guys who were like, like for instance, Demetric Felton, the guy who they took in the sixth round. That was yeah. a guy that they were linked to a while back. Um, Anthony Schwartz, people were 
I think there was a lot of rumors about him. Tommy Togia was the only one. Uh, Tommy Togia and Hudson were the first two that I didn't hear any connections with. And then mm-hmm. Tony Fields and LeCount were the ones the, that I didn't hear anything with. But all the day one pit, day one and day two picks, it seemed like they had some kind of some kind of rumors to them, interviews, things like that. So my worry with that is, is that teams are going to catch on to that and you're going to be able to start pegging who's going where with what picks and but the other end of it is, hey, listen, as fans, we're able to keep track of, hey, where the team might go in the draft. Right. I think they're I think they're smart enough to uh, kind of change up their strategy if that starts happening. No, I, th- I think I think they'll work around that. Um, but I, you know, I I would say if they're if they're getting guys like Fields and and Togiai, you know, further down in the draft, guys who really have a chance to make major contributions over their, you know, over their, the term of their four-year contract, you know, why do you, why do you need to trade up into the second round? If they feel like they can get these guys down there, you're getting them at a better, at a better contract. Not, not that a second round contracts all that, that big anyways, but um, it, it just makes sense, I guess, to stay put. If you, if you know that these guys are going to slide down the fourth, fifth round. Yeah, well, they had. A, I felt like this year it felt like a lot of players slid because of the injuries, because of you know the opt outs. People didn't know yeah. how to value certain things. Um, I think that's why a guy like uh, like for instance, LeCount was a guy who probably if he had not gotten into the motorcycle accident that he got into and had the bad pro day, I think he might have gone like fourth round or earlier even, and the teams yeah. would have valued him more. And I think that was one of those guys that teams got a little bit sleepier on because, oh, he didn't test well. And then so, of the pro day, which is a pretty lazy way to look at it. Well, especially really. because the pro days are too, like, it's a snapshot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to look at the film, you know, and, and study the guy a little bit more than that. If you're an NFL team, I mean, it, it's one thing if you're, just a fan and you're, and you're watching, you know, paying attention to the pro day and trying to figure a guy out from that. But when you're an NFL team, you need to dig a little deeper and the Browns are showing that they're not afraid to, to just spend countless hours working on these guys, you know, finding out what they need to find out and, and being smart about their picks. I agree. I, I think they did a really good job this year. Again, like I, I, what was like so outside of uh, Jeremiah Wusu Kormo? Because I feel like everybody was like screaming for him. The, like everybody in Cleveland, every Cleveland fan from around the world was begging for him to fall to them. Because again, even if you were like anti linebacker in the first round, there were still so yeah. many people who liked Jeremiah Wusu Kormo who were just looking at him going, like, that's a guy for the Browns. Coverage dude can yeah. do everything. <laughs> that elite level athleticism. They all, everybody, no matter if you were analytics dude a guy who loves jarvis a guy who hates jarvis a guy who loves the you know who who hated dorsey loved Dorsey. they all wanted jeremiah wusukoromoa and oh, yeah. he, he got to them in the second round so everybody was a big fan of him outside of the first two rounds what was your favorite pick of all those guys that like you know you mentioned fields and uh, we already talked about LeCount a little bit yeah i, I was gonna say uh, uh, uh jeremiah wusukoromoa is the the that's probably the first time i've ever stood up off my couch and kind of cheered for, for somebody outside of the first round uh, that I can remember. I was so excited when, when it got to the Browns, you know, because then you have this thought of, man, are they going to take somebody else for like half a second? Then you're like, Oh, they, they have to take him. And then when, when his name comes out, you're like, yes, you know, but um, for me, for me, I would say, um, I would say I like the pick of uh, James Hudson, which is a little controversial. Okay, James Hudson, the the tackle out of UC. Mm-hmm. I, I've had two kids graduate from UC, and I've got another one starting there. Oh, in, so there in, you go. In the fall. Okay, that that's part of the story. The other part is on my podcast. My brother and I have talked about James Hudson several times, and he's a guy that my brother really liked through studying the draft. Um, you know, he's a guy with everybody probably knows his story now, you know, he played, he played on the defensive side of the ball. He's moved over to offense. He hasn't played offense all that long, but you know, he, he's, he's big and mean and got a great uh, punch and some nastiness to him. And I think he fits the profile, of, you know, of a guy who's going to come in and, and going to learn from Bill Callahan and 
I, th- I think he could be a really nice swing tackle until he's, you know, in, until he's needed to, uh, to start. And, you know, I could see him being the, you know, the right tackle down the line. Absolutely. I think so. It was funny because people were talking about him. And then again, we were talking about weird pro days. He had a bad pro day. But yeah. He was, you know, again, another one of those guys. I also think offensive line pro days maybe get a little bit blown up a little bit because, like, just athleticism in general for offensive yeah. lines is a little bit different. Um, you look back to Orlando Brown falling to the third round. He had the worst combine in the history of combines. It's actually been a pretty solid tackle. Got, you know, got the Ravens a pick that was relatively high in the draft. So I don't know. Yeah. Like, that was kind of a yeah. good, good He's grab a good on their end. So sometimes if you're looking at these guys and you're going like, you know, Hudson was a guy who, you know, like you said, former D lineman, had good movement skills. Uh, by the way, uh, a guy who I really liked in this draft, Aziz Ojolari, he played against Hudson. He had a lot harder of a time against Hudson as he did against his backup. Blew up the backup like crazy. Like, the backup had no no business being there. But when Hudson yeah. was on the field, he did a really good job until he started headbutting. So, uh, yeah. he got a meanness to him. He's got good movement skills. I think they plan to play him at tackle and at least train him there to be the swing tackle. I think we talked on your show, Hubbard. You know, there might be questions. About, like, they're not going to tell us if there's anything with Hubbard until, you know, Hubbard doesn't show up. Like, that's just not right. Andrew Barry's thing. Andrew Barry doesn't talk about anybody's contract. He doesn't talk about anybody's injury. They're going to let you guys try and find that out for yourselves or let the players talk about it. <laughs> that, I, and that's right. why I love about him. Yeah, there's not a bunch of dirt floating around. We, we don't need all this stuff, you know, to uh, trying to find out who's on their way out and all this. That's not good for the team. No, I mean, Andrew Barry knows that. Stefanski knows that. And I think the players respect that. You know, and that, that's just a, a great, you know, a great thing that's happened with the Browns, you know, just over, over the past season. I also you know? love their press conferences, by the way, because they look like they look like a little like a buddy comedy show. Like, it's such a weird thing. Like, the two when the two of them were in the press conferences together, I'm like, I feel like I'm watching an episode of Psych. Like, I feel like behind the scenes, like Stefanski's playing pranks and Andrew Barry or vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> like like Andrew Barry actually wasn't supposed to be a GM. He was supposed to be selling like pharmaceuticals somewhere and like all of a sudden it's like, yo, let's go run a football team and he's just like, Okay, let's go do it. And it's like yeah. and now they're drafting like great players in like the the fifth, sixth round. Um Crazy. But yeah, I, I really like that pick. I also like the Austin Schwartz pick. Uh, Anthony Schwartz pick, the the speedster out of Auburn. Like oh, I fell absolutely. in love with him like I think what was it like uh not too long ago, but like uh, especially because I didn't think they were getting Elijah Moore. I just felt like he was going to be a top 50 guy. I didn't think they were going to take him in the first round because I felt like there was a defensive player that would be there that they would really like. But if yeah. Elijah Moore – I think Elijah Moore was another one of those guys. If he made it past 50, man, they would have been calling up phones being like, yo, we want to get up yeah. there. What's it going to cost? But he yeah. went – Jets Think took so. him. The, the, those, those, those smarmy Jets stole, uh, stole Elijah Moore. Picking Maybe good, good draft. players. What are you doing, Jets? What are you guys doing? Be back. You guys aren't supposed to be good at this. Only one basement dweller coming back up from at a time. You guys got to wait your turn. Like, we're we're doing good. You (laughs) got to let us get good players. He probably wouldn't have made it all the way down there. But, again, I liked Elijah Moore a lot. I think that was their their token gift. But I liked Anthony Schwartz a lot. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited to see him on the field uh, with that speed. It's going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, people that are worried about, you know, him just being a speed guy in this. I mean, he he, uh, he put up some decent numbers, you know, and, and their their offense really didn't feature the pass that much. So I think he's – I think his ceiling's probably a lot higher than what people are, are thinking right now. Yeah, like I think Baker Mayfield's a little bit better than Bo Nix. So I'm, I'm <laughs> guessing. I might be wrong. Maybe Bo Nix develops. Yeah. But as of right now, I think uh, Baker Mayfield's a better quarterback – I think they're going to be way more like having a little bit more fun with him in the offensive design, both as a deep ball uh, guy, but also, you know, the, the gadget tree to get him behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, he did a lot of crossers when he was at Auburn and getting, just getting him. Oh, the yeah. ball. So get him yeah, a little bit fun after catch that, that breakaway ability though. And again, that frees up guys like Jarvis and Odell. who Like when they came into the league, we're both really big run after catch guys. They came into the league and yeah. they were, I think they were better than the running backs at run after catch at one point. Those guys were like one and two. And then it was running backs and tight ends. So maybe you get them back to their old ways. And and then they still have, you know, the tight ends of like, we have like 30 tight ends now. It's just a tight end circus. <laughs> yeah. I, another guy people are excited about is Marvin Wilson, the, the uh, oh, yeah. defensive tackle. 
Um, that was my dude. I, I was like, oh, I can't believe we got him. Like, because I'm like, I, I didn't see, because like the, yeah. that news came in later. Like, because I was like one of those, like, because uh, he was a UDFA. And I'm yeah. like, I'm like, yeah. the news started coming in. I think I was at, I think I went to a Dave and Buster's. They finally reopened those by me. Uh, cause my girlfriend likes playing DDR. So we go up to there and I start pulling up my phone. I'm like, Oh my God, yo, they could have taken him anytime on day three. I would have been happy. That was great. The fact they got him, Tommy Togiai, and then they even signed Malik McDowell, who, uh, you know, a, a guy who's like a, Malik, a former, yeah. former second round pick of the Seahawks. I thought that was an interesting signing on their end. So and, uh, they're and Damian fun Square from the Chargers. Um, they're just, I think they're trying to corner the market on defensive tackles. They just wanted to get cheaper. I think that's actually the point is getting cheaper at positions. You still want good players at positions like D tackle and yeah. linebacker, but especially cheaper, like not expending the resources. That's why, like, uh, I think maybe Bar well, Barmore got st uh, the, the Patriots said Barmore's falling. We'll trade up and get Barmore. That was a, that was one of those drafts. I went, that wasn't that bad of a draft for the Patriots. Um, right. So, you know, if he had fallen a little bit further, I think they were also in on the Lynn McNeil because I think they actually had, like, interviews with him. He went after the second-round pick. He didn't make it anywhere near the third-rounder. I really think if they hadn't traded up um, to get uh, to get uh, Jeremiah Wusu-Koromoa, that second, third-rounder would have been Quinn Miners out of uh, Whitewater, the the guy who was at the Senior Bowl who has the nest big tummy and that's just sticking it out of the shirt. I think that oh, was the yeah. guy who, if they, didn't if they didn't do the weird pick swap with the Panthers, I think mm -hmm. that was a guy they really liked for that spot. And I think when they traded, when they did the pick swap, they knew, like, okay, we got Jeremiah. Well, okay, like, we got one at that, at that 91 spot. We got to make sure that we're getting a speedster because they needed a wide receiver. They did need to add to that room. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did. Did a great job. I mean, just just a great job. And um, I I don't know about Rich, Richard LeCount um, if he's going to make the team. I you know all this attention on linebackers. We we really don't know what kind of uh, what kind of sets we're going to see most often from this defense. But I mean, we might see a lot of four two five out there. Yeah. You know, in which case. Uh, you know, they're going to want an extra safety. You know, they're going to carry a crap crap ton of defensive backs on this team if, if that's the case. Well, I think what we talked about the last time when I was on your show is that they might be moving to, like, listen, we'll keep four linebackers, five at most. Yeah, you know, they might be very moving possible. Like six, you know, five, six, seven safeties because the coverage unit needs to be very versatile, and especially if you lose somebody – you know, the safeties, it was funny, I was watching the interviews of Robert Sala, because what I do as part of this show after the draft is I watch all the interviews of the GMs and the head coaches, and the Robert Sala inter interview was kind of very enlightening about how his view on the difference between safety and linebacker, and it was very minuscule. It was very similar to how the Browns referred to it. I don't remember who uh, on the Browns talked about it recently after their, I think it was after the Tony Fields pick when they were differentiating mm -hmm. between linebacker and safety. And he's like, well, really, the main difference is if you're lining up by the post, you're safety. If you ever have that in your your playbook, that's the safety as far as what the Browns said. And what Robert Sala said is, listen, there, the difference between a box safety and a linebacker, it's minuscule, and we can coach that up. Yes, there's a learning curve, but it's not that hard of a learning curve. So yeah. Joe Woods being uh, you know under Robert Sala for a little bit, you know, being familiar with John Lynch taught him as far as converting safeties to linebackers, you know, I think there there might be, hey, listen, if we do run low on linebackers, we'll get them a safety that, that could play that way. So I like everything that they've done. I like, you know, the second they brought in Barry, the second they brought in Stefanski, I thought this was such a cool, like, like again, I love that, that visual. The two of them sitting next to each other was so fun. It was just like, it, it looked like they were about to go on a road trip. So what yeah, are you what 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 are your feelings? Where do you think this team's going to be at this year? Because again, we had so many new players on defense and like a couple of new players on offense. Um, where do you think it's going? Because like I, I know there's like everybody's like playoffs are bust. Uh, you know, I think that it might take time well, for the defense to gel even. Yeah, I mean that that's one part of it. There, there's going to be a lot of new guys out there on defense, uh, a lot of new starters. So I think it's going to take a little bit of time for the defense to. To, to find its own, you know, uh, it, it depends how the schedule looks first few games. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. Hopefully they, hopefully they get a couple of, uh, you know, easier games to start with. Not that there are any truly easy games in the NFL, but, uh, you know, 
to to kind of find their footing. Um, man, if the, the this defense, want. yeah, if the defense starts out hot, oh man, the, um, this team could this team could really do do some things this year. Um, you know, kind of. Uh, I, they could really win a lot of games. Yeah, I but, like it a lot. I think again, if that defense yeah. gels, uh, the and I think there's a lot of pieces there to really like. I, no matter what, Denzel Ward is a great player. No matter what, John Johnson the third was a great pickup for them. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, that you know, Taki Taki is a good role player. They're gonna probably utilize him a li- maybe even a little bit more in blitz packages now that they have man coverage corners with Newsom and Greedy possibly coming back and Ward and Troy Hill. And it's just just like names upon names upon names. So, I th- this should be so fun. I'm telling you, so I'm really hoping it's either the Vikings or the Lions early on because if they can, those teams are going to be a little bit slow starter. I think. Yeah. So. Um, we should yeah, I think. By it, Wednesday, I think actually. Um, that's right. Yeah, they're they're releasing the schedule next Wednesday. So uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, this isn't Madden, so you you have to. You got to implement all your new, you know, any new game plans and all that stuff, and and uh, they, these new guys have to learn the playbook and everything. So you know that stuff can take a little bit of time. But if the Browns are fortunate with with injuries, and of course we know they're a deep team, so they're going to be able to survive even some injury bugs on that. But um, you know, if, if they can, if if they can uh, come together as a team early, and and uh, you know, um, avoid major, major injuries and just, just play well. Um, you know, I don't, I don't see, I don't see why they wouldn't have a heck of a season. And, and we know it's important that they get hot near the end of the year. That's kind of what it's all about. Absolutely. And I mean, we even saw it last year, like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers did not gel instantaneously. Their defense caught on towards the end of the year. The offense adjusted. We never really gelled at all until like the like one of the last couple games of the season then in the playoffs. Well yeah, yeah the Browns, yeah. forget about it. It wasn't until that Steelers game, which I we we went on that at your your show where it's just like the most amazing playoff game ever. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Just like but that was like the the moment of like by the way, like I'm like A V P should be probably calling a little bit of the plays, I'm thinking. Just like let him call a little bit. Just Stefanski, you can <laughs> yeah, not like he's been a bad play caller either. But I think it's, again, part of the Anthony Schwartz thing is that we're adding dynamic, adding speed. Demetri Felton, I think the real question with Demetri Felton joining the team is um, Dearness Johnson. Because that was, I think Dearness Johnson was actually a very underrated returner. Like, I think that was our best return guy. I think DPJ was not that great. I think Dearness. I I really like Dearness Johnson. uh, But, but yeah, um, I mean, Felton. Felton could really add another dynamic, too, you know, being able to, I mean, he can. He can line up kind of, you know, anywhere a back would line up or as a receiver plus return. So, um, you know, he could be a really valuable guy because he can do so many different things. So um, it, it, it's going to be – I re, for me, I really need to sit down to kind of figure out who I think even has the best shot at this. And this is before these guys even start practicing and, and, and all this. Um, just to, to try to figure out a composition for this roster. Um, because I would have a hard time seeing Dearness Johnson go, um, you know, over, you know, over a guy who's going to probably play kind of mostly, probably more receiver, I would think. Um, Dearness Johnson's a really talented guy, but obviously he's not going to get a huge chance to carry the ball here in Cleveland. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, running back's hard thing to make valuable unless they trade one of the top two guys, which I don't think any, it would, anyone would uh, think that's doing. Just, yeah. <laughs> with, with Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb, I think that, that's a good combo to have. Um, yeah. I, I think the value of Dimitri Felton is the fact that he can be that like that backup for three different spots, and that that's that one extra piece. Maybe they don't keep a, th- a fourth tight end this year. Maybe they only keep three. Maybe that's Steven Carlson's that's, spot. That's a possibility. Yeah. The only thing is, Steven Carlson was, was was good on special teams. He got both of those onside recovery returns, and it's like, thank God, man. Yeah, he's thank good, you. but you know, if you got if you got more guys, uh, more safeties, you know, and uh, you know, um, my, you know, more safeties and linebackers, um, you know, making the team, maybe maybe those are your special teamers. You know, maybe you got a couple extra guys there versus some of the other guys. Um, 
I mean, it, it's it's going to be. I'm glad I'm not the guy who has to kind of sit down and actually make the decisions on who makes this team because it, it's going to be tough. Oh. But you, you got to realize as a Browns fan that some guys you like are probably not going to be here when the season starts. And that this is, this is what happens when you root for a good team and you keep bringing in good players. And the only way you get better is by competition like this. Yeah. It, so that's a good thing. It's, it's an amazing thing. It's, it's funny because that becomes the debate of which good player, which better player, which good player, which player do you want to keep long term? Which, which one do you see the having the better yeah. arc or something like that's where I think the debate's going to be the next couple of years. Now, sometimes that might make the debates on Twitter a little bit more entertaining, um, but that's <laughs> yeah. also what makes the debates like it, but it's what makes a good team. Like, uh, I was having this discussion with a Bills fan the other day. They have the same argument about Tremaine Edmonds that Browns fans have about Jarvis Landry. And I'm like, oh, really? This is just what good teams do. Yeah. He's, but, yeah. I, He's I really am excited about it. I would, so, I know you were paying attention to the Browns draft. How did you feel about the other three teams in the division? Because that's going to matter a lot. Like, was there anyone that you felt worried about when they had their draft? Um... You know, I, I think, uh, I think, and I, you know, I, I think that the Bengals, uh, and I'm not worried about the Bengals at this point, but um, I, was, I, I was surprised they didn't take uh, Sewell with their first pick. Um, to me, you have to protect Joe Burrow first, and I know they took a tackle in the second round, um, and I know they got a, a great talent with their first pick, but if that, if that's the Browns, I guarantee you they take the tackle. Oh, for sure. I, I especially because of how much. Well, I, I think you also look at what you you invest in free agency. Um, yeah. They probably could have, if they went after say somebody else for instead of going after Riley Reef to be the right tackle, they could have went after you know Curtis Samuel to be the wide receiver. They could have spent their money differently, and I, I think they kind of yeah. showed their hand early on when they started mm -hmm. spending their money on offensive linemen and changing that right. up. And then, like, clearly they were drafting Jamar Chase by the time we got to the week of the draft. So I I agree, though. I've, a, I'm nervous for Joe Burrow's ACL because that's, you know, this is a guy who played really well when he was at LSU, came in, number one overall pick. And everybody's like, that offensive line's been bad for like three years, and you guys have still not really addressed it very well. Because Bobby Hart yeah, was the right tackle for you last year, and he ended up being one of the better ones. That's not a good sign. That's not good. I do That's think not they good. Did better on defense. I do think like the, the assets they accumulated on defense for the Bengals, it's not worrisome levels, though, because it's still Lou, whatever his name is over there, running defense. And I don't think he knows what defense he's running. So, you know, I heard uh, yeah, I'm, not saying, I'm not that concerned about him yet, but uh, but I thought the first pick was interesting. So, I mean, yeah, Jamar Chase is, is great. I'm sure he's going to have a heck of a career, but man, you got Joe Burrow there. You got to protect your your main asset. Yeah. If that guy gets killed again, I mean, yeah, you're in trouble. Your your season's shot again. It doesn't matter who you have out there running patterns. Well, good thing so, is um, we have Miles Garrett and that could help him get some sacks. And maybe yeah. people will give him the respect. we got a few other guys, too. Yeah, now. And, uh, um, I mean, you know, the Steelers, uh, they got Najee Harris, but I don't know who he's running behind, so good luck. Um, you know, the Ravens, I don't – they they always draft wide receivers. Uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Because you got Lamar trying to throw the ball. Um, I, I'll be honest. It, for me, as long as the Browns are drafting and have Andrew Barry making good, solid picks, I'm not worried about what these who these other teams are taking, because I think the Browns are, I think the Browns are ahead of these teams, in in the ability to to accumulate talent right now. No, I, I agree. They they've been doing very good, and even like when you look at guys who are on the roster from last year. It's maybe not everybody got to play a bunch, but you're also now looking at year two of Jordan Elliott. You're looking at year two of Jedrick Wills. 
You're looking mm-hmm. at year two of you know, of Grant Delpit coming off the Achilles, but still, like you're hoping that he comes back and is a force. So, yeah, so many different pieces coming back together. Harrison Bryant, who honestly looked like a really good route runner and a solid blocker, but he's got to learn how to hold the ball. That's just his one issue. Maybe he will do that. You know, getting in the weight room, learn how to hold. Like, they'll do like ball drills, like the medicine ball, like have him chuck it around a little bit. Um, yeah, I think that first fumble kind of spooked him a little bit. So yeah, I, I think he's I think he has better hands than what he what he showed. So so hopefully uh, hopefully he'll have a great season. But but yeah, I think I think I think the Browns are going to carry those three tight ends, and I think they're all going to play. Oh yeah, well, and Joku's great. The Harrison Bryant looked like he was developing. And then Hooper's been pretty solid. He got it, Hooper started looking like he was able to make some moments happen towards the end. Uh, he, I think Njoku's just a different kind of cat, though. They don't make him like him. They, you know, like we, Kyle Pitts is the Super Saiyan version of him, but that's about it. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, like yeah, like Njoku is the guy who can make the big leaping bounds, and is even when he's covered, isn't covered. So. I, I wonder if they're going to extend Njoku. That's the guy who it's like looking into the future because tight end contracts aren't that expensive. You want to keep a you know a good expensive tight end around. It's not even. It's like it's still half the price of an expensive wide receiver. So I could see them. Oh, you're right. Him. I could see you're them. right. That's that's an interesting point. Um, I, I'll be honest. I I didn't. I thought they were going to let him go and save the cap space with Njoku because it would have saved them. I think six or seven million or something this year. Um, but you know, they, they, they decided to keep him, and, you know, I hope he has a great season. So especially um, because if he walks in free agency, makes a big contract, then now you get a comp pick out of it. I think there's a lot of, well, yeah. I think the comp pick formula is coming in on that. I think you look at the guys who they signed in free agency, all these one year deals with uh, Jadavian Clowney and Tack McKinley they're hoping mm-hmm. they have big years and get to walk in free agency, make some buku money, and then oh, we get a third round comp pick. Oh, how nice! Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, I, I'm I'm very excited for that. I want to see. Was Jadavian signed the last time we talked? I'm, I think the rumors were going around. I don't know if we were officially. Done I don't after. think he probably wasn't signed at that point. So so yeah. Um, what were your feelings on that? Because I I don't remember the your opinion. Also, that meant Sheldon Richardson hadn't been released yet. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm excited about Clowney. Um, you know, I, I don't know what he's going to do sack wise. I'm not worried about it. I think he's, you know, I think he's, uh, he, he can be a force. He's great against the run. Um, I, I hope he can stay healthy. You know, I, I hope he and miles play most of the games. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, they, they both have had issues with staying on the field all the time for various reasons. So, so man, if we can just see them both out there, if they can both both be on the field most of the time, man, it, it, I think it's going to be pretty scary for other teams. You can't double both of those guys, and they're going to double miles. Yeah, and you know everybody's going to double miles. Uh, they can't really triple miles anymore. So, <laughs> so um, you know, yeah, so that, they're going to create some problems because they, are, you know, then they got to deal with yeah. uh, Jadavian on the other side. They got clowny and, and you know, hopefully, hopefully, uh, out of this crop of defensive tackles, um, the Browns are going to find some guys who can not only play the run and get some penetration, but you know, maybe get some get some hits on the quarterback too yeah. this season. And I think they might blitz a bit more now that they have this coverage unit there. I think the blitzing thing might be a little bit more in the cards. I know they were like, I think they were like 30th in blitz percentage last year, but that's because you literally had to play, you know, two safeties high all the time because uh, guys could only cover in zone coverage. So outside yeah. of Denzel Ward. Now you yeah, have I think you're guys. right. Yeah, I think you're right. It, it's going to change things up, and I think you're going to see more blitzing, definitely. Which is and they, they've got. Up. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, I think you'll, I think you'd probably see some five man fronts sometimes too. And, you know, maybe you'll see Miles and, and uh, Clowney and maybe Tack McKinley all out there at once. That'd be kind of scary. Yeah, the speed rush package. That's going to be crazy. Yeah, that'd be fun. Get, get Tack at the wide nine, get like Jadavian lined up on the inside or Miles lined up on the inside. I think that's going to be a sick, sick one for yeah. that one. I, I can't yeah. wait to see the cornerback battle, right? Who's going to be playing outside of uh, Denzel Ward? Because Greedy Williams, we're finally going to see year two of Greedy coming back from the shoulder injury. 
Greg Newsome, who I, I honestly loved watching him. You know, again, a guy who's got very good movement skills. I mean, there's very few guys can move like he does at corner and react the way he does. I would mm-hmm. be shocked if he was the best guy that came out of last year. He does have, like, the weird, like, uh, you know, soft tissue injury thing. That's something I think is more manageable. I think they can deal with that relatively well. So I'm kind of intrigued by him, and I still want to see what we get out of Delpit. If there's something there out of Delpit, that combination, you're just all of a sudden getting a rush of defensive players of, like, 15 guys now, it seems like. it's We just keep on adding more and more players to that roster, and it's just going to get yeah. – it's going to get bigger and deeper and scarier. Yeah, that's the thing. They, they've they added enough guys to where if if they don't get anything out of Greedy and Delpit, they're okay. But, man, if they do, if these guys are able to play and are, are on their game, man, this, this the defense is just going to be scary, and it's going to be so, so deep. Yeah. That, you know, I mean – There'll be a, 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 it, it's. I don't even know what else to say. It's just going to be fun to watch. Yeah, I it, and the only thing is, is like, who's going to be the fourth boundary corner? Like that's the only like now we're down to like the fourth, fifth guy on the roster of like a, of like a particular <laughs> position. Like now we're getting down to the minutia of like who's like the ninth guy. I remember my, I was telling my cousin, I'm like, well, they just need to sign a corner free agent. He's like, dude, like, you can go into the draft with some needs. I'm like, not the Browns. The Browns don't have needs. They have they have like a wish list. That's how this goes. So I listen, I, I think this is a great year so far. Great off season. Yeah, you know, it used to be that uh, not too many seasons ago we would be watching a Browns game, and if any one of the starters anywhere went down with an injury, we're like, oh crap, we're we're done. Yeah, we're just done. The game's over, and. This team is not going to be like that. You know, not that we want any injuries at all on this team, but but this roster is deep enough that they're they're going to be they're going to be okay. Well, that was the thing. That was the thing last year. That's what I learned from this roster last year was that anytime something went wrong, they had an answer. And it feels like they're trying yeah. to do that again. Like we they saw had guys ready to go. Yeah. Not only talented guys, but the guys were coached up. They came in, and, and most of them played pretty darn well. Yeah. I mean, again, like, you had half the team out with COVID, and they beat the Steelers in the playoffs. You had uh, the Eagles game with no Miles Garrett. Didn't matter. Olivier Vernon decides to step up. Like, you know what? I'm back to playing real football. And then, again, that that was the saddest moment. He tore his Achilles, but he was he yeah. was in a roll that, this year. So, again, it's going to be a very, very exciting year for Browns fans. Now, again, we got to make it through camp. Everybody got to get healthy. I'm excited to see Baker year two in one offense. That's going to be fun because huh, oh, wow, yeah. two years, same same coach, same system, really? That's going to be a shocker. And, yeah. Yeah, he's got to just be thrilled to death with that. Maybe <laughs> have to not be looking at everything new coach. again. Yeah. But uh, any any other thoughts on uh, this year's Browns, the this draft, uh, any final? Anybody else you think uh, we're past the pre-agency point? Um, um, I, I'm just, I, I'm excited about the team. I think, uh, Andrew Berry's done just an outstanding job with, the uh, with the, uh, the free agents, with the, um, uh, with the draft, with the, under, under, you know, the, uh, the UDFAs, um, and, and, who knows? I mean, you, you never know who else he could bring in. I mean, there's there's still some free agents out there. If if he thinks there's another need on this team, uh, once you bring once they bring guys into camp and they see how some of these guys are performing, he'll bring somebody else in. You know, Steve um, Wilson revenge thing. I, you know, get the corner who the yeah. the Steelers just cut and be like, yo, guess what? Listen, you might not have a starting role here, but Steven Nelson. You get to ride with us to the playoffs, and you get to watch the Steelers not make it to the playoffs. How about yeah. that, Steven Nelson? You could be our yeah. high-end backup, rotate in. You know, we get you for a few games. Go ahead and kick somebody else inside. Come on over, Steven Nelson. And then maybe right. they bring back Sheldon Richardson, although it's sounding less and less likely as we get days and further on. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like there's still an opportunity for him to come back. I know they said it on the radio the other day mm-hmm. that uh, that they were interested in him coming back. Both Barry and Stefanski usually don't have that united of a front as far as messaging goes for one player. Um, they both sound like they've been in contact with his agent. 
Um, so maybe we'll see him back. It does sound like you know they're at least preparing for life without Richardson, and if if they get him back, it's a plus. So I would be excited if they got him back, just because it'd be great to have that player back. To you know what yeah. he kind of did, what he was in that locker room, kind of as like a good mentor. Um, to have around, and he was solid in a lot of games. He was a big part. You know, he had the fumble on Derrick Henry in the Titans game. So mm-hmm. he was also the one. I think he was the one who had the the welcome to football moment for uh, Joe Burrow, where he just slammed him on the ground and was like, "Well, sit." <laughs> I and, like, think so. Yeah. Nine yards by Sheldon yeah. Richardson. Sit down. I like that. <laughs> I I I I also just kind of miss Sheldon Richardson's face. He's like he's got that kind of like goofy kind of demeanor. Um, I think he was talking about it was a two years ago when Freddie was the head coach. They were asking like, so like, uh, he was like, yeah, I hope I hope Mason plays. He's like, did why? He's like, did you see him play last time? I hope he plays. <laughs> I like his face, I like his demeanor, I like his chemistry with the D line. It you know obviously right price, right? I'm never gonna question how they shop on the Browns defense or offense. I'm not gonna question it with Andrew Barry managing the checkbook. But it would be great mm-hmm. to have him back. That's the one guy who I'm like, I like that guy. I kind of, I, I, I always dug Sheldon Richardson as a player. Yeah, and they've, and there's so many DTs in camp already, man. Just why not? Let's just blow this thing wide open. I just, I would love to just watch all these guys just, just uh, in their banging heads, just trying to make this roster because guys want to play for the Browns now. They want to be a part of this. Yeah, that was that's what really makes it exciting. I remember a few years ago, yeah. it was the Tony Jefferson one? Was he the one who was like, I'm not going to the Browns. I'll take a discount to go to the Ravens. And it's like, well, dude, you did nothing on the Ravens, and now you're kind of sitting here watching the Browns go to the playoffs and beat other teams. So how yeah. you got it, man? I, good on you. But you know, now now everybody's like, you know, like Richardson might be take might be willing to take a discount to go to the Browns and come back. And the thing I like yeah. about Richardson, he's versatile. They could play him at edge. They could kind of move him all over the line of scrimmage. Another one of those guys where he's not just hey, he's like he, him and Malik Jackson, very similar kind of players. So that was kind yeah. of the writing on the wall when they signed Malik. It was kind of like, oh, they're at least covering in case they have to get rid of Sheldon Richardson's big contract. But overall, like, yeah. again, I've been loving the moves that they've made. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any final thoughts? I just, uh, just thanks for having me on. I mean, uh, it, it's always great talking Browns and, Absolutely. um, man, I, it's, uh, I'm ready for the, I guess, I think I'm ready for the season. Right. It feels like uh, it's so far away now. It's so far away. It, like, it is. I just yeah. got my Christmas presents, but I want to use them. I got to wait yeah. for the batteries from the store. Plug it in, charge it. Oh my god! Then I wait for my friends come over. It's like you get an Xbox, but you don't have the games to play with the Xbox. It's like, what was the point of this? I have to like, I can watch TV on my Xbox. Great. Yeah, I, I agree. I want, I want to see the toys in usage. I want to hear news. I want more stuff. It's, it's not yeah. over till it's over. Yeah. I, can we at least like start training camp or something so we can, you know, do something? Yeah, we gotta get this started sooner. Come on, Treader, move off of the whole uh, mini camp thing. Let's go ahead and start sooner. Uh, I, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Like I said, I had a lot of fun on your show. I hope you had fun coming on here. I, you know, it's, absolutely. Uh, yeah, good time. Yeah, and again, I love talking Browns with people, and I love talking about anybody's team, but especially the Browns because it's my team. I enjoy it, and it's just so fun to be invested in this team right now. It might, you know, what it was. It was you don't have to it, you don't have to be happy to be a Browns fan out of like out of sarcasm. It's now like I'm a Browns fan. There's something good we're looking towards. This is great. It's not it's like people are looking at me wearing my hat. It's like, why are you wearing that in New Jersey? It's like, shut up. I'm a, I'm a Browns fan. Leave me alone. It's it's so great to be a Browns fan now. And, uh, and and now like and now there's and I love the team and I love the players. The players are all characters. They're all amazing characters. Miles yeah. is funny to watch. Did you see Miles when he was like doing the pick call? That was amazing. I oh was, yeah. Was that for oh, uh, Schwartz? Where he came up and he had like the biceps like um, bulging out of his like jacket, being like. Yeah. I don't know if anybody. I don't know if anybody heard who the pick was because everybody was looking at Miles' muscles saying. Oh my gosh! How many pounds of muscle has he put on this off season? He's just huge. That guy, he's like, he's just a house. He is a ginormous. Like mm-hmm. again, I ugh, uh, Joe Burrow sitting there going like, why didn't they get a tackle? Why didn't they get a tackle? Please get another tackle. Tackle every tackle. We just draft tackles. <laughs> like you want to draft Jamar Chase? Fine, but draft me five tackles as well. We we're gonna need we're yeah. gonna need a bigger line. That's it. We're, <laughs> 
Just pull in more people. We need more linemen. Just we're gonna do yeah. max protect every time. Start start six uh six six linemen and and a couple of uh, tight ends too maybe. Yeah, they they really might. I mean, like, and they got rid of Gio Bernard. I can't believe the, the Bengals don't make any sense. I I really wonder what ham sandwich you're gonna put in there next. I I just I don't get it. The, that team is it, first time they've ever traded down in forever, so that was kind of shocking. But I yeah. again I. It, I'm so excited for this year. The only team that looks like it actually did something smart was the Baltimore Ravens, and even still, I'm not like worried. Like they still la- they still have gaping holes on their roster, so I'm still a little less yeah, worried about some. the Ravens. Yeah, it was other teams that had better drafts. I mean, like the Jets. Uh, you know, I thought uh, Detroit had a nice draft. Um, I was a huge fan of Detroit's draft. They, yeah. they, went, they went all, like, we're, kneecap fighter all around. Penny Sewell, Lynn McNeil, Levi on yeah. uh Monter St. Brown. I like that yeah. whole draft class. It was great. Yeah, it was great. And, well, you know, you're talking about the Bills. The Bills' first two picks, man, um, you know, on, on the D-line, um, kind of a little bit scary there, too, because they already have some guys on that defensive line. So, so that's a... Uh, that's a little bit interesting. I don't, I don't, re- I don't recall how the rest of their draft went, but um, oh, Bills took the two. They took uh, Gregory they Rousseau took, and they took Carlos. They took Basham. Rousseau and I like both those guys. By the way, I knew that I knew the yeah. Browns wouldn't take Basham because he's just way too old Basham. for them. They just don't. They don't, you know, they don't like the olds. They like the news. I get it. Yeah. But yeah. um, but then they took two tackles back to back. Um, I believe it was Spencer. Uh, I want to say it's Spencer Brown was the name. But I might be getting that wrong. But this guy like blew up the like I think his RAS was like he was like a 99 percentile athlete, like off the chart okay. crazy athlete. So yeah. they took back to back tackles and back to back DNs, which was weird because I don't think tackle was really their worry. I felt like it was guard. But again, I I, I did think they needed edge rusher. They're looking for life after Jerry Hughes. So, but mm-hmm. there was no draft that made me go, oh, I'm worried for the Browns prospects. Like, oh, we have to play them next year. I feel worried. Yeah. Chargers, yeah. maybe. Chargers finally figured out they need a draft offensive lineman in the first round, which was like, what? You guys figured this out after Philip? Yo, Philip Rivers is coming out of retirement just to kick Tom Telesco's butt. He's just like, what the <laughs> heck, man? I was here seven, I was here 16 years, and you guys go ahead and draft offensive lineman now. Really? And and Herbert's like, what did I do? I just, I, I, they actually finally are starting to get things right. I don't know what's going on with the Chargers. It's blowing my mind. That one was nuts. Um, but you're right. Like, there's not any of them that worry me too much. Even the Ravens picks. Like, I'm shocked the Ravens didn't go safety. I'm shocked the Ravens didn't go more offensive linemen. Um, I mm-hmm. get it. They signed Alejandro Villanueva. Good news for the Browns because um, Miles Garrett has his number. Like, he he's like Alejandro Villanueva. Why would he go back to the AFC North? Like, eh, all right, fine. We'll dominate <laughs> him there too. You would, yeah, he, no problem. He would have been smarter about that. He would have been like, I'm going to go to a team that I don't have to – like, I don't have to play the Browns twice a year because, like, Miles Garrett was always good at beating him, and now he's mm-hmm. switching to the right side, so he might be even – like, I remember when they've done that, where they move, like, any tackle, they move over 30 to the other side. I never, like, I just – oh, I, early on, yes. Like, when you're in your mid-20s, switch sides, switch them to guard, do what you want with them, but switching sides when you're at, like, 32, 33, 34, like, you're, you've built the muscle memory. It's not yeah. as easy anymore. So, like, again, Alejandro Villanueva, like, if they're going to be really playing at right tackle, got good on them, I guess. Good luck. I, you know, maybe we'll see what happens. The, my biggest worry was their signing of Zeitler this year. But everybody else, it's such a makeshift line. Stanley's coming off an injury. Uh, so I'm not really worried about the the bank, uh, the, the Baltimore Ravens. I think they took a little bit of a step back after their draft. Uh, so. than, I like the Oway pick for them. Like I thought that was a smart move because if there was one team he could go to, and it would actually he could probably be utilized right away, and in a way that that actually benefits uses what he does well. That's the one worry I have. Uh, Jedrick Wills, time's time to be the elite Jedrick Wills. Time for him to step up. Be like, you know what? Yeah. Ain't no one is taking me out, man. That's it. Yeah. We got Conklin. Conklin, you cover right. I got left. We got this down. We got the top offensive line in the league. Let's go. By the way, the one thing I want them to do, extend Wyatt Teller now. That's the one thing I want. It's the one Christmas list. Like, I get it. Maybe they won't do it. Maybe they have another guard on the roster. I just liked how he played this year. Wyatt Teller was so fun. And he's yeah. just, the demeanor, too. I remember watching the cut from the, the, the playoff game, and I'm like, oh, my God. This was so exciting of watching. He's just like, the Browns is the Browns. 
the Browns is the Browns. I loved watching his clips from that game. That's that Steelers game. Him and Hunt. I, I love those guys. They're they're all entertaining. I hope it continues to be a, a fun, entertaining, festive uh, uh, of amazement because it really is a fun team at this stage. Absolutely, I, I love all those guys. You know, I, I root for every single guy on the Browns roster, and it's a great, like you said, it's a great bunch of characters, a great uh, mix of personalities, and just you know, there, there's. You know, if you're somebody who likes a certain kind of player, a certain kind of guy, there's there's somebody on the Browns for everybody. I think you know to to really really like. Yeah. Again, it's I, I just the, the character characters, the how how they act, the the personalities. It, it, it's the oh, I, I miss Larry Okunjobi. I'll miss him. But I'm glad he got paid, and he got paid by the Bengals, yeah. and hopefully he doesn't play well for the Bengals, and then he got paid and stole money from the Bengals. That would be the best move for everybody. Just went over there to tank their team. <laughs> like he signed over to go hang out with Geno Atkins. They cut Geno Atkins, and he's like, "Well, now I'm just gonna suck because I came here to hang out with Geno, and Geno's now somewhere else." So I'm kind of crappy. See. We'll see what happens. I- I'm excited though. I'm excited for the season. I- I'm excited for having you on. Thanks again for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you you you're doing way better things than I am. So it was great that you got to come on and be like a part of the show for the night. And I got somebody on here. I don't get to talk a lot of Browns. So when I get somebody on to talk about the Browns with me, it's like, oh, this is gonna be so much fun. It's a whole other toy, a whole other day. I really appreciate it. If you want, you can follow Rod uh, Rod Bloom at C L E Rod B. And uh, also, he's got a podcast. It's called the Browns Blitz Podcast. Go ahead, check it out. He, it's a very fun podcast, and he has on great guests. Uh, some people who might have also been on the show. Just, just this guy who's only been on the, his show. It's been on that show, but still, I've been on his show, and there have been you better people than me on his show. So you go check it out. And thanks again for coming on, man. I plug in anything Absolutely. else you want to plug in right now, while you got the shot. Oh, that, that's about it. My stuff's on my Twitter account. Um, the the uh, podcast is is at the Browns Blitz if people want to check it out there. And uh, we've got links to the episodes there. But uh, the Browns Blitz, you can find it pretty much anywhere you find podcasts. What about, what about under the bed? Do you leave the podcast under the bed? Because I've done that every once in a while. I have not done that lately. Ah. I, I found I found an old podcast from like thirty years ago underneath my bed. It was that it was on a tape recorder though. It was like before podcast podcast. It was weird. Very uh, very big throwback. Uh, thanks again for coming on. It's always great talking to you. Thank you, thank you, Rob. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, it was a great show. I appreciate him for coming on. Go check out Rod at Rod Bloom. Uh, you can find him at CLE Rod B, or you can go ahead and check out his podcast called the Browns Blitz Podcast. It is a Browns podcast. I was on there recently as a guest, but he gets better people than me on there. So go check it out. And uh, if you want, you can follow the podcast at Draft Vice on Twitter at Draft Vice underscore football on Instagram. You can follow me at BROJO. Death is in the end of life. Punch like a delicious drink you drink in the summer. And uh, have a nice day. When I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. I'm about the past, I'm about the future.